Hello and welcome to the uh, to the first of hopefully a series of installments of um, of conversations uh, put on by the Vermont Employee Ownership Center. I'm Matt Kropp and I'm the Program and Outreach Coordinator at the VEOC and we're excited to have Dan Fireside of the um, Equal Exchange Worker Cooperative here to talk about uh, their their capital structure and strategies and they've done a lot of really innovative and interesting stuff. Um, but before we uh, we get going with Dan's presentation, um, we've got a couple other folks um, participating in, in the call today. So um, we'll do a quick round of introductions, um, starting with Andrew. Hey there, everybody. My name is Andrew Gansenberg. I am a senior in my last semester at Green Mountain College. Matt and I have been doing some pretty regular webinar chats uh, for a course I designed um, to help me learn about uh, employee ownership, especially worker-owned cooperatives. Uh, so this is kind of an extension of that. Um, I guess we'll pass it on to Louisa. I'm Louisa Shibley from Milk Money Vermont, which is an equity crowdfunding portal uh, for Vermont businesses to be able to raise money from Vermonters only. We're using the VSBO regulation, which is the Vermont Small Business Automated Commission. And we are looking at a lot of co-ops who are looking to do raises through Milk money and so we're interested to learn more. Awesome. All right, Dan, uh, do you want to take it away? Sure. So, um, let me uh, just give a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I, I've, I'm the capital coordinator at Equal Exchange. Um, I've been here for six years. Uh, Equal has been around, we're coming on our 30th anniversary. Um, year, which is pretty awesome, uh, and uh, um, it, it's also kind of interesting that we have a capital coordinator. Um, the, the idea is that a lot of thinking went into the company uh, when we started. You know, there there was no uh, local food movement or people thinking about where their products were coming from, um, and. Uh, the, the founders of the company were, were pretty far-sighted. Um, they, they probably uh, didn't imagine what the company would become, um, but they had great ambitions. Um, and uh, they put in a lot of things that, in hindsight, um, were, were really fundamental to our success, um, whether they realized it or not at the, at the start. Um, and one of them was really not, not just our cooperative structure, um, but realizing that as a social enterprise, um, thinking about, you know, and, and that term wasn't there, uh, where your capital comes from and the form it takes is essential to uh, the, the survivability of the mission and the sustainability of the mission of the company. Um, and we've just seen that happen uh, with many Vermont companies, you know. Um, but some of the, you know, companies that we have admired and seen rise up um, over the years, just get snapped up and uh, become part of the global, you know, capitalist behemoth that we all started these funky, weird enterprises to to create an alternative to. So, um, with that, I will share my screen and. Um, I was in co-op, and uh, my my info is here. Uh, I part of my job is actually uh, in the spirit of principle six, um, cooperation among cooperatives, a national you know, co-op uh, credo. Um, part of my job is to help other cooperatives and businesses that are thinking of becoming cooperatives. Um, to follow, uh, to learn from you know our work and our example, and take whatever is useful and and run with it. So feel free to reach out to me in the future. Um, I enjoy it and, and it's part of my day job. So I, I like to sort of frame this as you know we, we don't operate in a vacuum, um, and w when you talk about social responsibility and alternative businesses, um, you know. This is still the mainstream idea, um, 
from this famous 1970 uh, New York Times essay that Milton Friedman wrote. You know, uh, you know, go out and make your money. If you want to do good things, go off and start a foundation. But um, uh, running a business is about business, and the ultimate thing is profits. And it's run by its shareholders, and those are the only people you're accountable to, and the only thing that they care about is money. Um, anything else, do on your own time. Um, another way to put that is, is uh, a little more tongue-in-cheek, um, you know, by, by John Maynard Keynes, capitalism is astonishing belief that the most wickedest of men will do the most wickedest of things for the good of everyone. This, this idea that, you know, it's this... Uh, you know, doggy dog world, and uh, everyone's out to press their advantage. And uh, basically, uh, you know, here's this idea that, you know, in a normal in the normal economy, it's just sort of taken for granted that everyone goes out. Uh, you're the the business. You're you're squeezing your suppliers. You're the supplier. You're trying to, you know, s squeeze the company. Um, you're uh, the bosses are trying to, you know, get the most out of your workers and pay them as little as you can. You know, the workers are trying to get away with as little as work as possible and steal all the office supplies. You know, you're the, you're trying to rip off your customers. Customers want to rip you off. And outside of it all are the investors who are just trying to suck up as much profit as possible. And it's supposed to leave this wonderful world in its wake. And we've seen. You know, I, I think that it's a very successful model at squeezing out profits from from everyone, um, but it leaves a lot of damage in its wake. So that's that's the dominant model. You know, you you, you raise any kind of ethical concerns with most companies, and they say, "Hey, you know, bottom line, we got to make money," and that trumps everything else. So come equal exchange, the founders say, "You know, okay, let's just not do be the cool company that this." buys organic coffee or buys fair trade coffee, which didn't, you know, neither of those things really existed in the U.S. At, when they started. But they said, okay, no, let's, they came out of the cooperative food supply industry and they said, well, that was cool, but we weren't even a cooperative. We were just supplying other cooperatives. And we weren't even thinking about the products behind, you know, that were the source of our livelihood. And, um, we need to do that, you know. And they, they searched around for different products, came around to coffee, which which was good fortune, um, at, at good timing. They said, you know, just there are a lot of idiots making money in coffee. And if at the end of the day that's all we do, it, we'll have a pile of money and we'll just be another bunch of idiots who make money in coffee. They said, Let, let's do, use coffee to do something really interesting. And they, they were very committed to the social mission. They said, if we're successful, what is success? What should success look like? And let's think about every aspect: how we, you know, not just buy, we organize, how we sell our products, how we relate to consumers, how we finance the whole business, and let's think about profits um, at the start and put it into the DNA, and not just say we have a big pile of money and let's be generous. So they said, and let's do that, you know, before the revolution comes. Um, so at the heart of it. There's farmers. Um, this is Santos. One one interesting thing is every worker in the company, um, every when you enter the co-op, you have to visit a producer co-op. Um, all of our uh, products come from uh, either farmer-owned or small farmer cooperatives around the world. So we're sort of stuck with own farms. Um, and every single member of the co-op has to go spend a week or so with the farmers. Um, as part of their job, um, whether you're entering phones or packing boxes. Because you have a very different perspective on, you know, the, our business. So the idea was creating links between a farmer and and consumers. And, you know, at the time there was only one Valdez was the only image. And the global supply chain looked like this, which was basically lots of craziness and circles and arrows. Um, and as you went down, and you process the product more and more, you sucked out more of the profits. And the people who did most of the work at the top, the farmer, got pennies on the dollar. So they said, well, here's a different model. And based in cooperatives, you can't buy directly from Santos, who has you know, 2,000 pounds of coffee a year. 
um, that he needs to process and sort and grade and all these other things and then ship and run containers. But if he's part of, if he joins with several hundred others or several thousand other farmers, they can export in quantity and quality. They can even eventually buy their own mills. Um, they send it to us. We roast it. And we sell in every U.S. grocery co-op around the country. Um, we also think, you know, how we're selling it. We sell to cafes. We sell directly to consumers. We sell to faith communities. Anything we can do where we're able to really communicate a message and not just deliver a product. And then, you know, here's our, is hopefully you're familiar with cooperatives, our, our crazy model that says, you know, all the workers are, um, are up here, and we each get a vote in the, an equal vote in the bylaws and um, major company decisions. And we get to elect all of the seats of the board. A majority of them are held by the workers, and three are outside folks, but they can never outvote the you know, majority of the workers. They do normal board things, including hiring and firing the president of the company. We actually have a co-directorate. One of the original co-founders is uh, Ring Dickerson is, is the co-president, and Rob Everts is that they share the executive directorship. They're also worker owners in the company. And then we have a somewhat conventional management structure with you know them at the top and managers and so forth running the day-to-day -day business. Um, so that's all great, but then and, as you know, a big challenge, how to finance it. Um, you know, where do you go? You go to, okay, you have this great idea um, for this funky alternative company, and, you know, where do you get investment from? Uh, friends and family, okay, but, you know, we need a bunch of money. Um, go to the venture capitalists. Um, and, you know, here are some Massachusetts folks. Um, and, you uh, they have that other model of, okay, how are you going to, you know, why are you paying the, the farmers so much? And can you pay them less and make us more? And who are these workers? And how are you going to flip the company in five years and sell it to Starbucks? And ultimately, you know, they don't, they're thrilled if you're doing wonderful things and making them piles of money. But if you're, you know, pumping oil into the Gulf, um, but at the end of the day, you're still making money, you know what, all is forgiven. So... That's just, you know, the normal narrative that we're facing. Um, we can't go to, you know, the bank of Karl Marx. Um, this was actually uh, an East German, uh, that they, they had an election or, or online vote to design uh, a MasterCard image, and this is the one that won. But sadly, uh, the bank of Karl Marx is not, not yet um, set up for, for such enterprises, maybe under President Sanders. So where do we go? Well, you, you go to the workers. Um, uh, to put in their initial share of money as, as a cooperative. Um, but that only gets you so far. Um, you uh, can have retained earnings. You know, after a while, you have profits and you keep them in reinvesting in the company. That's great. You can get loans. Um, and we, our first loan is from the Cooperative Fund of New England. I'm currently on their board. They, they are an amazing resource. They've been around for 40 years and fund cooperatives all throughout New England, including many in Vermont. Um, but uh, the other interesting innovation, really, was this idea of preferred stock. So here, this this is actually, these numbers have changed a little bit, and mostly gone up. Class A, so this is the, the workers. It's an important thing. It's the money that's most at risk, but it's, a it's you know, this is sort of five-year snapshots. Um, it, it's, it's a really tiny share of our capital pool. Um, loans uh, have sort of, you know, stayed roughly flat, but um, a big chunk of that's our mortgage uh, and some lines of credit, things like that. But as a share of our overall capital picture, as the company grows, it's it's become a smaller percentage. Um, and then retained earnings, and this is an important thing. You know, this is we deliberately set aside profits that will not go to investors, will not go to the workers. Um, and are invested back in the company, and over 30 years, it's a nice pile of cash. Um, and that really represents the legacy of everyone who's ever worked here before and didn't cash out. And it's our investment in the future and the people that come after us. But one of the more interesting things and our big real innovation um, was the idea of using preferred stock. Uh, ben and Jerry's actually um, 
did it in, in a similar fashion, as, as some of you are probably aware, where uh, they, they sold stock in the state of Vermont. Um, we actually, there's a different exemption that we use. You know, usually when, when you sell stock like that, um, you can design it however you want. Uh, and the normal thing is uh, people are investing with the I idea of an exit strategy. You're either going to go public and the shares will you know, vastly increase in value or you're going to flip the company. But we actually put in our bylaws a restriction that says we cannot sell the company for a profit. We can transfer it, but if we ever sold the company, after we would pay back the workers, pay back our loans, all the retained earnings, we pay back any investors, whatever they put in, we would hand them back their money without any appreciation. Um, and then all of the remaining assets, including any of the, you know, the, the sale price, would be donated to another fair trade organization. And that's in our bylaws. And what that has is the beautiful effect of us never even considering a sale of the company. Uh, we probably get them. And no one ever talks about it. And no one ever comes into the company saying, ooh, how is my class A share going to you know, quadruple in value? It's not on the table. No investor. I, I dissuade them of that idea immediately. That's your agenda. You're in the wrong place. And, and that's really that's unusual. It should be usual, but you say, no, we're, we're here to create a, a legacy um, and a permanent institution like a trust. But it is a for-profit business. Um, it, it's sort of in this interesting alternative space. So um, this is uh, as I haven't updated with the 2015 numbers. Um, they've all gone up. I think the loans have gone down a little. The Class B were over 16 million because we had a big offering um, last year where we actually sold over $4 million in stock. Half of it came in 14, half in 15. Um, uh, sales have you know gone up nice and steadily, which is great. Um, profits, we were profitable after our, our third year. And in 1997, we had a sl small loss of, you know, seven thousand dollars. But all the other years, we've been profitable, um, and growth has been steadily upward. Not, you know, into the stratosphere, but uh, pretty darn good. Last year, we grew about five percent. Um, so the Class B shares. This is the preferred stock. The idea is, you know, you can design it however you want. Um, it can change every quarter which is a real pain, and you only do that if you're really going to sell the company. So we said, you know what, the, the, the share price is fixed, it's an arbitrary number, nothing to do with multiples of earnings and things like that. Um, so it's just a flat price, uh, there are no capital gains. It has, um, you have to hold it for at least five years, um, which is, as it turns out, uh, how long it takes uh, a new coffee plant um, to grow before the tree starts bearing fruit. Um, and it can last for 20, 30, or more years. So you can hold the stock for longer, but the minimum is five years. You have no voting rights. So this was you know, the big challenge for cooperatives and alternative businesses was how do you get the capital in without giving up worker control or control by the owners? And um, the idea was, you know, so the fixed price means if you put in $10,000, and five years later, you want it back, and you can only get it back from us. There's no secondary market. Um, we'll give you back ten thousand dollars. So that's not a very good deal. So the idea was uh, we would offer a dividend every year. Um, unlike an interest payment, uh, the way we structure a dividend is that it's not guaranteed and it's not cumulative. So if we ever miss it, um, we're, we there's no expectation we're going to make it up or obligation that we'll make it up in a future year. Um, the target rate is 5%. That it's a target rate means uh, it, it's, an, it's a commitment, but it's not a legal obligation. So if we, we could pay 0% for those five years, and someone could sue us, because you, know, you can sue anyone, but you would lose. Um, our lawyers have assured us. Uh, and we make that very clear in all of our offering documents. Um, you're, you're taking your chances with us. The maximum by law is 8%. Um, and the way it works is um, we wait until uh, we have our financial numbers from the year before, 
And then in our February board meeting, we make a you know this I make a recommendation with this, uh, one of the executive directors, um, and we have a discussion at the board. And the discussion is really, is there a good reason to pay more or less than five percent this year? Did we have a gangbuster year? Did we uh, you know profits were way out of line with what we expected? We raised prices to the farmers, gave everybody raises in the company, and socked some money in the bank and we want to share that with all of our investors as well, and maybe we'll pay a little more. Um, did we have a terrible year? Are things really tight? Uh, did we lose money? You know, so on and so forth. Maybe we'll pay less. Maybe we might even pay nothing. And out of that pile of profits from the previous year, um, we will allocate a percentage. If it was everything in line with what we expected, hey, we'll declare five percent. And we also know that what we do has an impact on our reputation, and our legacy, and our ability to raise capital in the future. So we have to weigh all these different things. Um, and then, okay, so we've created this thing. We have to find investors. Um, this is a little bit more of the details, and all of these things I'm, I'm happy to share. So um, we're a national company, uh, and we we have investors all over the country. And we have, we have you know, our main headquarters is in uh, about 30 miles south of Boston. Um, we have cafes in Boston and Seattle. We have a West Coast warehouse distribution center in Portland, Oregon. Um, uh, we have offices in the Twin Cities and Cleveland and another cafe in Chicago. So we're, we're and we sell all over the country. So our supporters are there. Um, so we decided to have a national capital raising strategy. Um, we use uh, the 506 exemption of Regulation D, so um, you know of the Securities Act, which allows you to raise capital from the private markets. Um, what we do is you have to come up with something that is equivalent to uh, um, a prospectus. Uh, the, the, the wording of the regulations are a little bit vague. It doesn't say, here's the form you must fill out and exactly the information. It just says something pretty close to your perspectives. You know, the idea is you need to fully disclose all of the risks, all of the you know, works and all of your business. You can't just say, hey, it's all going to be great. We think it's all going to be a winner. It's, this is the, you scare them off and try to tell them everything that you think reasonably could ha happen badly in the company. Um, and we, we follow something, we use a template created by a couple of different state regulators called the SCORE form, S-C-O-R, that is a list of about like 80 questions that we just kind of go through and answer. Um, and that, that tends to sort of satisfy all the regulations. And we are very happy to share this beast of a document that we have. And, and I'll also sort of add, if, if, if you're involved in this stuff, you know, working with lawyers. Um, you have to work with a lawyer on this stuff. Securities law, it's not rocket science. You can figure it out. The rules, you know, as long as you follow this, the, the rules and operate in good faith, you'll be okay. But the rules are a little complicated and you need someone who understands them to make sure that you're not doing something that you think is right but turns out to be wrong and it's a big mess to clean up. However, a lot of lawyers are not familiar with working in this alternative way. And they say, you know, no, look, uh, I'm used to helping companies raise capital, but you, you turn over board seats and give up control and get rid of this clause that says you can't sell the company. And, you know, and what we do is we say, adios. Let's find another lawyer that understands what we're trying to do and gets it and says, let's figure out how to do this. This is really cool. And there's a growing number of lawyers who are learning about this and are excited about it. Um, we're also happy to share our recommendations and folks we know. And sharing the, that information is just really important. It's still a small group of folks. Um, it, we have audited financials because we're big enough. Uh, you, you know, you, you don't always need audited financials, but if you do, that's great. Um, we put ours on, on the web uh, for all to see. You need a subscription agreement, which is just the form that they the investors fill out. Um, that uh, you know, the, the big question is accreditation. So, 
the securities laws make it very easy for people of means to invest freely in private companies. And they make it very difficult for people who are not wealthy to do that. And the definition of wealthy, according to securities law, is if you have assets, net assets of a million dollars or more, excluding your primary residence. And, you know, the basic idea is uh, people who are wealthy either are savvy enough in business that they can, you know, spot a scam um, and evaluate risk, or they can hire someone who can help them, or they're rich enough that they can, you know, take their lumps and, and move on. But what regulators don't want is grandma in the nursing home getting ripped off by a fast talk. Now, they don't mind that grandma goes off and buys a stack of lottery tickets um, or goes to the casino. That's fine. But heaven forbid she should invest 500 bucks in equal exchange. So, the, like I said, the laws make it easy for accredited investors, and that's all that means is that you, you have a million dollars or more or certain definitions for institutions. Um, you're not on some list or anything. Um, however, the, it is possible within the regulations to accept up to 35 unaccredited investors per offering. And an offering has a beginning and an end and a maximum dollar amount. Um, you, you have your board pass a resolution. Um, and when the offering is over, you have to wait at least six months before you do another offering. And then you can get another 35 unaccredited investors. Now, for us, this is very important. You know, obviously, it's easier to raise money from wealthier people um, in smaller, you know, large chunks from smaller number of people. But as as we've seen in politics, you know, uh, there's money in in the crowds, and the idea that a democratically organized organization with cooperative ideals should be financed by a larger community um, it is very important to us. So we actually have several hundred unaccredited investors. Um, so this is actually, again, sorry, a little out of date. We're, we're well over 16 million. Um, and one element that we do is, so we, we're cooperative, and part of our profits are divided among the workers of the company, the, the worker owners, uh, as we call ourselves, the co-op members, um, absolutely equally. So Rink, in here, 30 years, uh, co-founder, co-president, gets the same exact profit sharing check that I do that anyone in the company who has worked here a full year gets. Um, we take, we pay half of it out in cash, and we put the other half into what we call the internal capital account. And it's held back in an account that invests exclusively in the preferred stock. That account, um, and you can only access it, you only get that money the year after you've left the company. So it, it's it's separate from a retirement account. We actually have 401k and matching, um, and I have some issues with that. But we have um, everybody has an internal capital account. The longer you're here, the more it grows and it earns the dividends. So if we ever pay a zero percent dividend, we're, we're paying zero percent to ourselves. That account has about a million and a half dollars in it, um, or a little more actually. And it added to that class A share, we the workers of the company have about two million dollars invested in the company. We're the single largest shareholder uh, as a block, but we're still a tiny part of the whole capital pie. Um, but it's very important that we have a lot of skin in the game, and it's very uh, it's a good selling point to outside folks. You know, I say we don't guarantee that you won't lose your money. What we do guarantee is that that we'll work really hard to make sure that doesn't happen because it's our money too. And if you ever did lose your money you'd feel good about it because uh, you knew that we were doing the right thing. We weren't, you know, uh, dumping oil on, on penguins and seabirds, and we were trying to do the right thing, and sometimes business doesn't work out, and, and you'll actually feel good, not like the housing crisis or other things where you've lost money. And that seems to be pretty effective. The other thing is our track record. Um, so here we go. After we started making profits, we started paying our dividends, Couple years, a little bit lower. Couple years, even uh, two years ago, we we pay a little bit higher. Most other years, five percent. It's actually um, again must be updated a little bit, and I think it's actually done a little better once we've paid this year's dividend of five percent. Um, it's 
over a 10-year period uh, match the S&P 500. Now, that's not what we try to do, but I think it, it talks, it speaks to the success of our model. Um, that this is a viable alternative investment. Um, people need to make a return on their money. Um, they understand that there is risk. Uh, you can put all your money into an index fund, and it might plummet in value. You have no idea why. You know, somebody in China sneezes, and um, oil drops, and suddenly, you know, the markets go crazy. And then they jump up, and they go crazy. Um, I don't know why they do it. Nobody really understands the markets anymore. This, you understand. Hey, we made a profit all these years. We grew all these years. Um, we had a bunch of money. The business was sound. And we kept paying little returns. And those little returns add up. And um, it's actually a good deal. Um, the financial crisis, uh, if you go back three slides here, you know, what happened here? Uh, stock market tanks. We keep chunking it, you know, churning out these 5% dividends, and people go, whoa, I thought you were my crazy hippie, you know, donation. I never expected to see my money back or see a return. Suddenly, you guys have saved my bacon. And uh, then the next time we got to raise money, people are banging down the doors to hand it over to us. Um, we've also thought carefully, because we need different kinds of capital. Um, we started out, you know, with a cooperative fund in New England. We kind of got too big for them. We ended up going with some conventional banks, and they put, you know, uh, covenants and conditions on your money. They have very firm ideas. They're they're thrilled again, you know, that if you're doing wonderful things, they're happy to put you on their poster. But at the end of the day, the only thing they care about is the return and your ability to pay, and that you don't represent a risk to them. And uh, so we got to a point where we said, hey, let's uh, shop our, our, our business around. And again, we made our life more difficult because we could have just gone with one conventional bank, done all of our business, gotten a pretty good rate. We said, you know what? Let's spread the money around. Let's, um, we, we have Eastern Bank, which is a mutual that does our day-to-day -day banking because you know, we're, we're buying olive oil from the West Bank of Palestine and coffee from Uganda. The local credit union doesn't want our business. But RSF Social Finance has our mortgage. Um, the National Cooperative Bank uh, has a line of credit based on our receivables. Eastern has another line of credit and a term loan based on um, our inventory. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then I set up a, a lot of individual loans. Actually, this upcoming debt offer is an ongoing one where uh, we had a loan from the Calvert Foundation that was expiring. We decided to sort of crowdsource it as an experiment, and I offered it as a security. Basically, I said, five-year loan at 4.5% or a three-year loan at 4%, promissory note, um, minimum 50 grand, and sent it out to a bunch of people who want to throw money at us, and including a lot of financial advisors who are really a small group of financial advisors who have clients that are really excited about this stuff. And in the last month and a half, I'm at $900,000. We're trying to raise one and a third million. And we're going to do that in the next couple of weeks. So there's a huge demand out there. You know, it takes more work. You know, Suddenly, I have 20 lenders instead of one. That's 20 checks. That's 20 you know, 1099 forms. That's um, people's addresses, you know, these are individuals. It's the, the administrative work is higher. People call me up, you know, just servicing the loans and servicing, the, we have over 600 investors now. Um, it's a lot of work, so that there's a cost to that that isn't just shown in interest rates or the dividends. But um, this, is, this model has been adopted on a national level and uh, local level. The, the direct public offering model that sounds like um, has been even taken further in Vermont. Um, I'm not even you know up to speed on some of the changes. A lot of changes have happened just in the last couple of years while I've had this job, which has been awesome. Um, breaking down that accredited uh, investor barrier, which we think you know needs to be revisited. We're fully in favor of there being regulations. We think, and I am you know my mom isn't a 
uh, retirement home and has memory issues, and I, I worry about people fast talking her out of money. Um, so I'm glad there's regulators. I think you need full disclosure. You, you need someone watching over this stuff. But it, you still need a way for smaller companies to access capital from their community of supporters. And um, the direct public offering model is basically uh, where I prepare all the documents now with these federal offerings, these private placements. Um, and I'm prohibited because I'm selling to unaccredited folks. I can't do any advertising. I can, I can go to conferences. I can talk to people on webinars and this and that. And people sort of get the word out. I can write about our stock program. And people kind of hear about it and, and through different networking. A lot of my work is schmoozing. Um, uh, but um, no regulator ever looks at my documents until or unless there's a problem. If we get investigated or somebody sues us, it really doesn't happen. Um, and, and again, that's where transparency and openness really is to your benefit. We have nothing to hide. If we had 0%, people would understand why. Um, the direct public offering, the idea is you go to your state regulators, you have to follow their set of rules. In general, you need to come up with all your documents and everything beforehand, get the regulators to review them, answer any questions or make any changes they, they demand, and they can take their sweet time doing it is the problem. But once they do, then you can generally um, be very public about it and go to the general public in your state and collect investments, and you can make the minimum much smaller because you're, you're allowed to get many, many more investors and do more crowdfunding. So in Massachusetts, um, Dorchester Community Food Co-op, a brand new startup co-op, haven't even opened their doors. They've raised several hundred thousand dollars. Um, Cerro raised uh, their this clean energy. They collect food waste and turn it into energy and are in Dorchester, you know, sort of inner city community and have a lot of, like, ex, uh, folks with prison records that have a hard time finding jobs elsewhere. It's a really cool, amazing cooperative worker co-op. Uh, they raised uh, several hundred thousand dollars through a direct public offering. Real Pickles, an established business um, based in Massachusetts, did an offering in Vermont and Massachusetts, raised about half a million bucks in, like, six weeks um, using... Yeah, a lot of these outfits are basically copying our documents, modifying them somewhat, um, and having great success. Uh, then other, this is a co-op in North Carolina that called me up, copied my documents, and ran with it. I, I just was on the phone with a, a, a startup a grocery co-op in Sitka, Alaska, um, who was very excited to, to work there. Lumio is this global um, uh, decision-making platform that uh, came out of the sort of Occupy Wall Street movement and is getting lots of interest from venture capitalists and people that want to, you know, make billions of dollars. And they said, no, let, let's, we need money to grow, but let's think about ownership and getting money from people to support us. So the idea is taking off. Um, you know, I think we're seeing it all around us. Regulations are changing, making it easier. Um, and you know, we're, we're happy to share all of our experiences. Uh, th there's different lessons to be learned depending on where you are um, in your trajectory uh, as a company. Um, your strategy sorry, your strategy as uh, sorry, can you see me? Okay. Um, as a startup, it's going to be very different than as an established company with a history of revenue. Uh, if you have profits, that's even better. Um, yeah. When you get in trouble, just carry um, a tiger. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we, we, we can, yeah, we can see your picture now, but... Um. Okay, I don't know why the uh, the camera isn't back. Um, sorry about that. Um, so that's that's the the short and medium of it. Um, sorry, I don't know why my camera isn't happening here. But so um, 
let's open it up to, to questions. Um, cool. Thank you. Th thank you, Dan. That was that was really informative. Let me also just say, I I'm since I get a lot of these inquiries at this point. People who are in cooperatives or alternative businesses who are raising capital seem to find their way to me eventually. It's great. It is, I have a green light from my bosses. They know I can raise the money to equal change needs really easily, and it's almost too easy. So they said, go off and help others who, who need it even more than us. Um, I'm trying to write a guide right now, and and it's it's interesting because you know I, I have an easy job because I can say look at our track record, look at our financial history, um, piece of cake. Uh, it's much more challenging for for startup co-ops or uh, ones that are in more difficult regions, um, but it's not impossible, and, and they're they're doing it, and I think we just all need to keep sharing uh, this information and strategies and struggle that works or doesn't, and even to have a template of others. Cool. So, so, so I'm thinking for um, for for questions. Maybe we can do kind of one one round of uh, kind of one from each each person, and then just kind of open it up for more of a general conversation. Um, and Janice, since you joined us um, a little bit late, do you want to maybe start and give uh, give also a little just sort of introduction to your your your, your context here? Um, sure. Uh, so I don't know if Louisa told you much about um, Milk Money which is a company that she and I uh, founded uh, and we're just uh, starting to get it up and running. But we are taking advantage of some of those state-based regulations that you mentioned. Um, in Vermont, we uh, have a pretty forward-thinking Department of Financial Regulation that's put some state-based crowdfunding regulations into place um, to do direct public offerings directly to Vermont, just like Ben and Jerry's did. And what Louisa and I have done is created um, an online portal to actually facilitate all that. So, you know, putting up, um, finding companies that want to raise uh, local investments from Vermonters and, and bringing the, the, uh, the investors to our site. And by the way, we love your tagline, the, the small farmers, big change, because uh, on our website, uh, our tagline is small money, big change. So we're right on, right in keeping with that. So um, thanks for, for giving, this has been great um, background. And I just, I have, I have a question about you know, how many or how often do your current investors come to you and ask to be cashed out after they've passed the five-year mark? Is that something that has been burdensome or you haven't seen any of them do it? Just a, an idea there of what, what's going on. Sure. No, and it, it, it comes back to a very important point. You know, you get... Uh, companies that are like, hey, we need two million bucks to build our building and carry us through the next five years. And this seems like a great model. But you need to start thinking immediately, okay, five years from now, everyone is eligible to request redemption. Um, how are you going to pay them back? And you can't just start thinking about that a week before the five-year deadline you pass the buck. Um, even though, so, even though it's equity, we really think of it as debt. Um, it, I call it dequity, uh, if, if you have to coin the term. Um, so, you know, the, the only way people get their money back, um, I'm going to try my camera again. But um, the only way you can get your money back is directly uh, from us. Um, we, it, we also, if we don't have the ability to pay everyone, there's a run on the bank or who knows what, um, then uh, we can convert your uh, your stock into a five-year promissory note at 5% mm -hmm. interest. Um, that is a guaranteed you know, interest rate that if, if we fail to pay it, we're in default. Um, in general, there's maybe about a 10% redemption rate it, it really varies. We, you know, we used to accept any kind of investment, 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, whatever you get. But there are limits to the total number of investors you're allowed to have, and there's an administrative burden. You know, you don't want to set your investment limit at 50 bucks and have 20,000 investors. Um, that's that's you're just too crazy. So um, it's gone up to 10,000, but we have some investors at at 50, 100, half a million bucks. So the question is, you know, I keep an eye on those folks, and I'm in touch with them. So, 
part of it is you need to have uh, you know dedicate resources to keeping in touch with your investors so that you know I, I I'm aware of our really big ones and say hey are you planning on buying a house are you gonna need this money if you do that's fine but give us six months notice um, and know that it's gonna take a little time for us to hustle up the money and they're totally cool with it um, yeah on average we try to have access to enough cash to redeem about 10% in any given year. So that's, you know, we're over 16 million bucks now, so that's a big chunk of cash, lines of credit, things like that. Yeah. Um, we give people uh, two options. You can either have your dividends reinvested every year or you can have them paid out in cash. Um, that's very helpful in that uh, I think to, to keeping longer term investors, um, if some of them need an income stream and, you know, especially if they're putting in larger chunks of money, they're happy getting these checks every year. Um, we have a lot that have been here a really long time. About two thirds of the people decide to reinvest, one third get out in cash. That that has a very important impact on our uh, on our balance sheet because or on, on our cash flow because even though we're paying a five percent dividend, um, uh, we're only really cutting checks for one and two thirds percent. Um, now we're adding that obligation. You know, on our balance sheet. What's interesting is, even though we think of it as debt, it shows up as equity on our balance sheet, which makes us much more attractive to lenders, um, because those people are on the hook first before the lenders. Um, so it has certain advantages. There's one big disadvantage to dividends, which is versus interest. Dividends are paid out of after-tax profits. Um, interest is a tax deductible expense. So same thing as, you know. Paying out of your pre-tax healthcare account versus, uh, you know, after-tax paycheck dollars. Um, five percent dividend is more expensive than a five percent interest rate. Uh, however, the the trade-off is control. Um, uh, you know, we have the flexibility. If you don't pay your interest payment because you're in a bind, you're in default. If we pay zero percent dividend, that's part of the deal. Um, and we really like that. And we like the idea of ownership. We, we like this idea that we're getting more and more people invested, literally invested, and, you know, symbolically invested in the company. Um, we have other grocery co-ops. We have farmer co-ops that have invested in us. Um, and they're not going to switch who they're selling or buying coffee from. Um, these are what we call committed participants. So. That, that was a very long-winded answer to your, your uh, specific question. But so there, there's two ways. So we, we, we have a growth trajectory. We want to keep growing. We know we're profitable. Um, so we can pay dividends out of the profits. We can redeem people out of the profits. Um, but we also have had regular stock offerings. So part of it is we're getting new money in, recycling, and paying off the older folks. So like a loan, you know, we're, we're getting a new loan to pay off the old loan. Um, because we can do more, we can make a higher profit margin with other people's money. So I would say it's, you know, if you get it up and it works, uh, do, you know, plan another offering in a couple of years. Um, you just need to have a capital strategy and have an eye towards those big, you know, balloon payments. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That, that's, like, hugely helpful. So, um... Andrew, do you have a you have a, you have anything you want to throw out there or ask next? Absolutely. Um, first off, hi Janice. I'm Andrew, uh, student at Green Mountain. Anyhow, uh, and thank you, Dan, for that talk. That's been fantastic. Um, I was just hoping you could expand a little bit on kind of new ventures or uh, young companies that don't have a long history of uh, revenues, um, haven't had a direct public offering before, um, and how, when they bring out their first DPO, how they can really attract investors, and, um, you know, what markets do you necessarily um, go after? Do you just kind of shout it out to everybody, or? Uh, so we're actually prohibited from shouting out, um, because of the exemptions that we use. So in exchange for the ability to raise money 
from investors all over the country not have to go through this pre-approval process of, of getting the documents vetted beforehand. Um, uh, I cannot do public solicitation. So there, I cannot put a thing on our website saying, hey, new stock offering. We cannot put it on our packages. We cannot um, uh, send out email blasts or put it on our Facebook. Um, the DPO model, you know, has that big advantage. It's the trade-off is, OK, you got to prepare all the documents and get them vetted first. Um, you're limited in your region to follow a bunch of other rules. But you know, the regulators have said not that you have a great investment, but that you are fully disclosing all the risks to the average person. So um, go for it. Tell, tell as many people as you can. I think what I've seen is you don't need to have our track record of having done a whole lot. If you have a couple years of operations and revenue and profitability, even you know a nickel of profits, that is huge. That puts you just in a whole other stratosphere. And that, that was real pickles. You know? And they did a conversion from a sole proprietorship to a worker co-op. They had a great story. They were even paying off you know, the original founders. Um, and, and it worked. They were almost like the classic case. If you just have revenue and operations, but you're not quite a profitability, that can still work. You know, as long as you have a story. We don't just need money because we're hemorrhaging money, but hey, we, we need to get the next big thing. Um, that makes sense. The startup is not always the place where you want to do a DPO. And the ones that have been successful have put a lot of work in before they sell their first share of stock. So don't this is not a vehicle to, you know, it's not a Kickstarter campaign. And actually I would say do a Kickstarter campaign. You know, get some donations, get some seed money, scrape up the money from friends and family and grants and however you can. Or try to figure out your startup business model that is as lean as possible. You know, again, the proof of concept is, is a world away from a concept. Um, so the Dorchester Community Food Co-op, they spent years, they got grants, they got city leaders involved. They got state folks involved. They got commitments to donate the land. They partnered with other nonprofits. They um, did a whole series of, uh, of um, farmers markets, um, community meetings. Um, they they hired. They got enough initial like Kickstarter campaign, and they got enough money together to hire a general manager, and business plans, and then they launched the direct public offering. And it's been hard, again, because you're, you're getting people to invest in something that hasn't been built yet. That's really hard. And their target audience are low-income people in Dorchester who, by definition, don't have money to invest. So um, they didn't just start with a DPO. They, they are doing a DPO even though they're still technically in the startup phase. Uh, I've seen somebody try to do a restaurant in New York City he said, ooh, this will work. Everyone loves co-ops in Brooklyn. Didn't do any kind of outreach beforehand, just sort of shouted it to the rafters, spent a lot of money on legal work, and got zero investment. So your first move can't be a DPO. It's also expensive. It costs several grand in legal fees, and it's a risk. And you need people. It is a fundraising campaign. Um, now. The thing that Real Pickles did, and Sarah, and Sarah also did a lot of grant writing and community organizing, and got their act together before, you know, for about two years before they did their DPO. Um, is, uh, you know, they got a lot of, they sort of primed the pump. They, they lined up some initial investments. They also used it um, as publicity for their business. So they're tr making it serve multiple purposes. Get your customers in, have parties, get the word out, get media exposure, um, and you know have it do double duty or triple duty, and not just see it as a way to get easy money. It is not easy money. It, it is really it's much easier to do once you have you know a couple years of track record to really scale up. It's it's hard money to get, you know, but it's getting easier, and the more people that do it, and more companies that do it, and more it becomes normal, then 
it becomes another thing. Like, you know, who the heck would have thought Kickstarter would have worked? You know, you're giving donations to a for-profit company, yet people do it all the time. Um, as more and more companies are doing these preferred stock offerings, and the federal rules are just about to change, like in the next month, to allow national crowd equity-based crowdfunding, it's going to be a total mess, and there's going to be a lot of scam artists, and it's going to be ugly, and it isn't necessarily the way you should go. But it's it's making these ideas much more approachable um, and understandable and accepted. So the thing is that equal exchange investors are they're like, what else is out there? I'm like, well, check out these other startup ones. We're we're cool, but your social impact is going to be huge with these other ones too. Don't put 50 grand into them. We put five grand. Um, if you could put 50 in equal, you know, if you put 10 in equal, give them a thousand bucks. Money that you can ex you can afford to lose. But if it works, you'll feel great about it. And even if it doesn't work, you'll feel good about it. Um, the other thing I would just sort of recommend, you know, your, your pitch is really about how this is a social investment. And if it just gets down to the money, you know, people have that other framework, the conventional framework. Well, there's the risk and reward. The reward is only financial. The risk is only financial. And at the end of the day, that's the only thing that matters. And if you get into that conversation, you're always going to lose. You know, this isn't why you're trying to do all this crazy things and why these people really are interested in you. And you need to get back to that social mission. This is a cool thing. This is, you know, people give me 10 grand and I give them a check for 500 bucks every year. That's kind of boring. I'm like, wow, you're funding a worker co-op that's growing and showing, you know, exposing the whole global food system and we're supporting farmer co-ops all over and we're supporting grocery co-ops and like this is cool, this is the alternative economy and we'll even pay you a dividend and that rocks and um, people are like yeah this is the coolest thing ever. Um, so that's what you're trying to do but then afterwards there's this obligation on the company to deliver that social return. So we spent a lot of money on our annual report and we even translated it into Spanish and sent it back to the producer co-ops and that's part of our delivery of our social return. Other local co-ops should be having a party. They should be, you know, engaging with those investors. If you all you do is just send them a, a tax form and a check every year, you've you've lost that magical opportunity to really show them that this is a different way of engaging. Um, so, again, it's a lot easier to get a bank loan and just cut a check. So, if you don't have the resources to engage with this, don't go this other route. There, there is a cost to it. Um, I, I'll, I'll sort of put in a little plug with my other hat. Um, uh, at Equal, um, because we have this much broader view of it's really more, you know, customer relations, um, and over a long period of time, I have 30 years of investor engagement, people move, they die, they get married, they pass on their shares to their grandkids. There's a lot of administrative work. Um, and you need to have careful, complete records. This is legal documents. You need to calculate dividends carefully. People lose their own documents, and they're counting on you to have them. Um, there's legal requirements. If you ever did run into trouble, you need to have everything backed up. We've actually created a platform, an online platform, that does all of the, the shareholder management. Um, uh, the IT guy at Equal and I devised this whole Platform. It's an online platform, and we've kind of spun it off as our own little company. Um, and we encourage it's it's just we just launched it. We don't even quite have the web page all set up, but we're using it at Equal, and it's a really cool program. And it's like about 600 bucks a year, um, and it, it produces statements and tracks all the legal documents that you sent to people. It tracks all the conversations, all the background info and calculates dividends and interest payments and things like that. So if you don't use a platform like that, you need to use something. You can track five or ten investors on Excel. When you get beyond that, Excel is not your friend. Excel is your enemy. Hey, so so uh, quick time check. We're just about at 11, but um, you know, I feel like this conversation is really rich. Um, I'm wondering, um, would you, be, uh, would you be, have the availability to stay on for like another ten minutes? Absolutely. Okay. I actually, I have to run. I'm being kicked out of where I am. So, Louisa, take good notes. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And Thanks. Spe spe speaking of Louisa, do you have um, do you do you have a question? Can you unmute me? Yep. I'm really sorry about my video. 
um, all of you. Oh no, it's that's that's totally fine. I might um just mute your your video so we can see the uh, the fine picture of you in the feed. Uh, okay. There we go. Dan, this was amazing for us because in Vermont, I mean, we basically we have the same limitations. We can only go to Vermonters, and we have the same marketing limitations. So one of my questions was is what was for you the best way for you to get the word out for marketing? Because we have a lot of companies, co-ops, and other and other companies that are using Visbo, which is the regulation that allows the companies to raise from non-accredited investors here in Vermont. So what was your best way for marketing to win your first couple rounds? Um, so, you know, what's, what's helpful to us is that uh, we're, we're a direct consumer, you know, we're, we're, we're selling stuff to lots of people. Um, and so, I, you know, and I wasn't here in those earliest days. Um, I, I think those people had the hardest job. Uh, I think there were a lot of friends and family and people connected. We were a very mission-driven company. Um, a lot of faith-based organizations were, were some of our best supporters. Um, you know, people who got the mission, first off, they weren't asking about our financials. They were like, this is cool. I would donate to you anyway. So the sort of first block is people are like, you know, I, I would donate to you. So you're like, yeah, you know what? We could have been a nonprofit, um, but our impact would be much more limited. We, so really, I mean, it was face-to-face. -face. Yeah, face-to-face, -face, really, and word of mouth. And then I, I think the advantage of, you know, we, we want people to use equal exchange as much as they can um, to, to use our success. So, yeah, it's like the equal exchange thing. They've been doing this for years. We didn't just invent this model. Other folks have been out there doing it. You know, we need many more success stories so you can say, this is, this is the way you can raise money. And it is a risk. It's not guaranteed, but um, it's, it's the most personal old school investing. You're actually putting your money into a company that gets to use it and they will engage with you. So, um, I mean, if with Visbo, if you're allowed to do marketing, um, getting new story is huge. Having parties, that's what Real Pickles did. I think, you know, they almost had it too easy. Uh, they, they had a really well-developed network of, of customer supporters, you just go, hey, you love our stuff. We want to keep growing. We want to raise money from you, people who love us, so that we can stay who we are and do more of it. And people just go it. So, so, I mean, sorry, no. No, 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 go ahead. So I was going to say is our platform basically is a place where, you know, we, Vermonters can basically, they have to give us their driver's license, and then actually they have access to any campaign. We have two coming up soon, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. So we're hoping that with the help of just our platform, because we're now a registered platform in Vermont, that Vermonters will obviously have the option to see these different campaigns. We can say on Twitter, we can say on Facebook, Vermonters only for Vermonters only help. We can't use the type of camp offering and because we it's we do others than just cause. So we can't say the type of offering or the dollar amount. But we can say for Vermonters only. And I think with the help of the platform, actually, we can promote the platform and not necessarily each raise, but we can help promote, you know, if a co-op is raising, the platform can promote the platform, which would attract Vermonters. Um, so I think in a way it's a lot, we have it a little bit easier, obviously, than you did a long time ago, the first round. Um, but my second thing was, is in terms of investor relations, afterwards, what really has been the best thing for you in terms of investor relations to sort of, you know, help expectations of, um, of your investors in terms of risk and losing money and stuff? So any tips for investor relations management? Yeah, I mean, well, I would say having a robust platform of, in, that, that, you know, so I, I came in six years ago and we already had, you know, 20 odd years of history of investors, wow. that, and they're all over the country, so I don't get to meet them all. I try to, you know, I, you know what I do? I, I pick up the phone and chat with people. Whenever they call to give me an address change, I keep them on the phone for 10 minutes or more. And, hey, we've never met. What, what got you to invest in equal change? And people have all these wonderful stories. They're like, oh, you know, I was in Nicaragua in the 80s and met the founders. You know, my, I, my grandpa was a farmer, and I just love, you know, whatever their hook is. And then you find out, and they're like, wow, I wasn't expecting a real person interested in me and my engagement. And they're like, hey, when's your next offering? 
Um, so once you have that pool, boy, they're your best bet, and they're telling their friends and relatives. Um, now, what do you do with that? Entry? If you just have all their, you know, their basic facts on Excel, that that historical information gets lost. So you need a platform that I can log every conversation I have. I can put background info so that, you know, if I don't speak to somebody for four years, I can see, ooh, the last time I spoke to them, you know, they just had a baby. And they're really impressed when I <laughs> say, hey, how's your toddler? Um, and whoever comes after me can have that history of information, which is just invaluable. So I would say having that is, you know, is key. If you just treat it like a bank account, um, then then you've you've lost that initial opportunity. So talking, spending the time, engaging with people, it leads to crazy things. You know, and for me, a win is whenever somebody engages in another part of the company. They're like, hey, I I have you know I go to the Unitarian Church, and I'm like, do you know about our faith-based you know coffee program where you can buy our stuff and at wholesale and sell it as a fundraiser and they go that I didn't, so then they start selling it there, or they go to the local supermarket, start carrying us, and um, people get hooked in. And then I, again, I have all of that information um, on on their background. Um, I, I, you know, I don't just send them statements. I send cover letters. I send out news articles. Now, you know, my my community tends to skew much older and not. Quite as internet savvy, so I still have to spend a lot on postage, um, and we actually are stuck with paper certificates. If I was starting from scratch, we would be much more electronic and save all that trouble. So do not do paper certificates; they're impossible to get rid of. But um, in another way, they're kind of funky and old school, and people like it. But um, if you have everyone's email and they're used to it, you can have regular updates. Yeah. Um, so the other thing is. You can't solicit directly for your offering, but you can talk about your offering. So this is where you know push it a little bit. You can say, "Hey, we're we're raising you know money from our community. This is, we want this to be a community resource. We're doing this cool alternative thing. You don't have to get into the details of the offering, the minimum, and the terms. You know, hey, if you want to learn more, you got to go to this website. This is not a solicit. You know that that little boilerplate. This is not a solicitation. Um, and what I actually do is I screen a lot of. People. I mean, I, I try to screen every single potential investor and make them talk to me and make sure that they're appropriate. We also spend a lot of time. If you'll see our docs, I'm happy to send them around. You know, you can write your documents to, you know, CYA, in case somebody sues you. Or you can write them to really inform people, and I try to write them in as plain English as possible, you know, but covering all the bases. And I want people to read it. I want I make sure I'm not getting grandma's nursing home money. I'm getting her lottery ticket money. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and when something goes wrong, they they got it. They they feel yeah no I knew what I was getting into, and we actually did run into one regulatory problem. One of my predecessors forgot to file a bunch of very important pieces of paper, and we had to go through, oh my god, a royal pain in the butt. We had to go back to 188 investors in 27 states and talk to 27 state regulators, and it was a nightmare. No regulator, one regulator charged us $500. All the other ones were like, you guys aren't the crooks we're looking for. I had to talk to all these investors. We gave them the option to get their money back, only two of them wanted their money back, and they apologized for it. Everyone else was like, "Oh, Dan, what a drag! I'm sorry you had to do this." And when's your next offer? And I really took that as a sign of this was all of that work of uh, communication, openness, transparency. And they're like, "Yeah, hey, people screw up. We understand. A little paperwork glitch, or you ran into some bad times. You know, we're actually trying to communicate with our investors. Hey, we might not be paying at five percent anymore. Margins are tough." We're actually trying to really boost up the wages of our bottom level workers, and that might mean that we're paying less than five percent for the next couple of years. People are like, "Yeah, well, I, I'm down with that." I mean, it's like that's kind of crazy. <laughs> what other investment do you have where they're like that? But that—that's all the result of communication, you know. And it takes time and thought. 
even when I'm not raising money to to keep people hooked in. So I would just sort of say you have to factor in. Not, you don't need a full-time capital coordinator, but whoever the ED is or the the board or somebody has that, and it's not just somebody called and making a change to their address, and you have no more engagement with them. I have one yes no question and then I'll let you go. Okay, and I'm sorry. The, the investor relations, the system that you have, the back end system, it, is it for you or do the investors actually can they log in and see? Or it's your it's at, it's for you. It's at the moment it's for us. Okay. Um, the outward yeah. you know, we're we're going to add that other capacity at some point. Okay. Just curious. Yep. Cool. Um so I might I'm one just one other quick thing I was I was kind of curious about that um uh, that I feel like in some ways kind of separates you guys a bit from a lot of other worker co-ops is the fact that you treat the internal capital accounts as these kind of class B shares, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of uh, a lot of worker co-ops will say, okay, that's just sort of sitting there, you know, earning no return, just kind of accumulating until it's paid out. Um, like, well, like, what was the what was the po sort of the point at which you you made that that decision, or like, because because that's definitely you know different than most worker co-ops I'm aware of. Yeah, and it's. It's interesting. We we did it. I think about um, uh, fifteen years ago, twelve, fifteen years ago. When it used to be patronage was a couple hundred bucks, um, so it wasn't really worth thinking too hard about. Um, and then we started becoming a much more mature business, and patronage, you know, was suddenly four or five thousand bucks, you know, in any given year. Um, so we we actually came up with a formula that said, you know, we pay our taxes first, we dedicate a percentage to charitable contributions, pay off the the um the, the dividends, then the remaining amount is divided 60-40, 60% for retained earnings, 40% for dividends, and then that's sliced away a little bit based on the percentage of work that was actually done by the workers. Um and so we came up with the formula. We, we might, we're actually going to revisit this formula, but the idea was um, we don't have to negotiate it every year. Here's the pile. But then we said, OK, that class A pile was just not being significant anymore, and it didn't represent a big enough risk. You know, we, we want people to feel like owners. And how do you do that? We could. And if you jack up that class A share, it, it becomes a barrier to people coming in. Um, we actually make it an interest-free four-year loan. And the, the other sort of thing is, until that loan is paid off, um, half of that cash allocation of your patronage actually goes to pay off your loan. So if you got a $4,000 patronage, $2,000 is held back in your internal capital account, and 1000 goes off to pay your class A share, and you get $1,000 in cash to pay your taxes. Um, once, so that gets a little more complicated. Uh, I think it's been great. I think it was one of those beautiful innovations um, where w we've gotten around that problem of the class A share being not that big, and it really aligns our interests when we're you know we're the ones sitting there deciding what the dividend payment is, and it affects us as well. So you know because th the problem we actually face is. The investors are invisible to most people in the company. You know, it's like, who are these people that are handing down big checks? Um, and I, I relate to them, and I get to know who they are, and I think they're all wonderful people and amazing, and um, and they're just invisible to most people in the company. So the idea that every single worker has a a, a, a piece of this game is really powerful too. To say, look, you know, we don't want to tank the business. We're actually thinking of one, one proposal on the table right now is maybe making a cap at maybe twenty thousand dollars or something like that because the, the risk is that um, if it you know somebody's been here thirty years and their pile is at eighty grand and they become risk averse they say we don't we don't want us to try new cool things because that's their nest egg um, so what if we cap it at twenty grand and they get their full payment every year. Um, we're kicking around different ideas. That, that's actually borrowed from Mondragon. Um, they, 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 I think, pioneered that uh, internal capital account idea. And 
we borrowed a lot. A lot of ideas came from the ICA group, um, who are just, you know, the generators of so many amazing ideas, like the Housing Land Trust and other things. Um, but what, what's also cool is you can, you know, we have our template. You can make variations, however, whatever makes sense. I'm on the board of Namaste Solar in Colorado. Uh, worker owned, they were a conversion solar panel installation company. Uh, they copied our documents very closely and have a lot of our investors. They're, they're raising millions of dollars in cost being stock. Um, they don't have a formula, so they, on the board, it's a little tedious. We, we you know, stakeholder balancing how much clarity, how much workers, how much the, the, the dividends, and I, I kind of advocate having a formula because it's almost like a little too much to, to look through every year. Mm -hmm. Or at least having a formula is a starting point. Is there a good reason we should adjust the formula this year? Um, but what's cool is you, you can make whatever rules make sense for you and, and change them. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, th th thank you so much for uh, for taking extra time, and uh, I figure maybe we can do just kind of a quick closing round. If anyone has any little little bit of final thoughts um, before before stopping the stopping the broadcast, but um, so 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 Andrew, do you have any any sort of final final thoughts on this conversation? <laughs> I have plenty of things that I could try to extend the conversation a lot longer, um, but I'll avoid that for now. Um, and just say thank you, Dan, for coming and chatting with us. I appreciate that. Cool. I, and, um, I say the same. I could go on for. I have a lot more stuff I want to ask. But would you? Are you open to? We have some co-ops here that Matt's actually been helping us with. That maybe if they had questions, they might be able to reach out to you as well. I'd be thrilled. And if we want to do it in a sort of, you know, group uh, forum, um, you know, I can come up to Vermont too if if there's that makes sense and do this kind of thing in person for a workshop, I'd be open to that as well. Cool. Talk, but, talk but, to Matt and you know, a handful of co-ops, so it could be really great really great for them. I mean, but I'm happy to, to do virtually um, as, as well, whatever makes sense. Yeah, I, it's a learning process too. You know, I, I, what works for equal won't work for everybody else, and so I, I want to really collect all these stories and the challenges. Um, I have to say, conferences are amazing. You gotta, you gotta go out to that. You know, I go to conferences. I, I meet three people, getting sandwiches, and those are the people that follow up and invest. Um, uh, so schmoozing is, is a big part of it. Um, workshops, writing about the models, it just brings people in, educating people. Um, the slow money groups, they're they're, they're interesting forums. They're not quite living up to. You know what what they uh, count to be all the time, but I think they're also malleable enough that that they're starting to realize the power of co-ops and and these kind of alternative things. Um, and alternative financial investors, there, there's a growing group of them that are getting a client base that gets this, that are eager for these things, and if companies do their homework and get their Offerings together in the right way, and are meeting the needs of those advisors, and have their systems organized. Um, then th those people are the ones helping to channel sizable investments, and so and and they keep asking me, "What else is out there? What else is out there?" So I, I see this market mismatch where the companies need the money, investors want to put in the money. Let, let's let's get everybody together. All right, with that, I'm going to stop the broadcast.